Um, thank you all for hosting me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, as uh, as uh, um, Sean mentioned, um, my name is Gina Bennett. I am Senior Director of Advancement Technology at Morehouse College. Um, advancement, which I didn't realize is until I got here, is um, we're basically shadow IT for the fundraising arm of Morehouse. Um, my background, however, is I, I've been doing um, project management and development management for um, more years than I care to, uh, to remember. And um, what I'd like to like, what I, what I really wanted to talk about with all of, all of our, our, our you know, seasoned IT professionals and, and managers here is, you know, we're always, you know, there's always something new with technology. There's always something that you're going to have to implement. But I think while it seems like it, it, it seems common sense, but it's sometimes when we're so busy with, you know, trying to do these implementations, we sometimes forget about the people. And that's kind of what this is about. Um, so what I want to start with is what do I mean by what, what is a paradigm shift, right? A uh, paradigm is just the way that we do things. And a paradigm shift is an important change that happens when the usual way of thinking about or, uh, or doing something is replaced by a new and different way. And when you do, when you think about it like that, you really have to get everybody on board with thinking about how your, you know, your vision of how you want things to go um, to really ensure success. Um, and to that effect, I'm trying to put together, um, you know, I, what I've tried to outline is five principles for this paradigm, for the success of your paradigm shift. Um, so the number one, and please, you guys, you, hopefully this resonates with all of you because, um, I know like I've got a hundred war stories that I'm going to tell you some of as I'm going through this. So please, like if you have like, you know, some thoughts or, you know, this resonates with you, you have a story, please share it. Um, because, you know, it's, it's bringing that up to the forefront of our, our, our project management and our, um, our, our, our strategies for, for putting these things together is what helps us make that, you know, bring that, that uh, success to it. So the number one thing is obviously people are the heart of your business, right? You can buy all the technology you want, but at the end of the day, you know, your people ensure the success of your business, whether you're customer service, whether you're retail, build, delivering a product, whatever you're doing. And the ability to efficiently and effectively deliver um, improves your efficiency and your customer experience at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, happy people are the key to a well-received implementation, right? It's like you could put everything together and have zero defects and everything and everything. What the hell is that, right? That's just, you know, that, that it doesn't matter how good everything was. If you don't have that, you don't, you, you don't monitor that perception, you, you won't have it. And so, um, to that end, I'll, let me tell you one story. This was way back when I was just starting out, cutting my teeth, uh, you know, as a business analyst, and I was on a, a project working for the National Council on Compensation Insurance. And then I'm dating myself because I was like, we're talking IDMS, you know, CI Kicks, you know, COBOL, all of this. I mean, I'm talking mag tape reels. We were doing, you know, we used to get like, thousands of uh, workers' compensation policy data on these big mag tape reels. And the project that my first project that I was responsible for was, you know, improving, you know, kind of speeding up that whole process of getting those ingested into the system so that they could generate workers' comp ratings and stuff. At the time when I came in, there was like a three to five day lag on these things. They had like tapes piled up to the ceiling. It was terrible, right? And me and my team, we were all like kids. We were like, this is the, I know exactly what we're going to do, right? And again, 30 years ago before they had like, you know, all of this, you know, Grammarly and everything else, we like scrubbed the data and we like figured out a way to, 
you know, parse all the names and put them in the proper case and make sure that inks were like INC period and did all of that kind of stuff. Same thing for the, for the addresses. At the end of the day, when we finished this project, those tapes went from 45 minutes of tape to process for, you know, however, 100,000 records that were coming in to about 45 seconds. And in one weekend, we like got rid of the entire back. My, my um, project lead and I were so excited. We had those big, you know, stacks of paper that you're going through that we um, took down to the team that was responsible for doing all of the manual um, data cleanups for the names and the addresses and all of that. Okay. I was so excited. I was like, she's going to be so excited when she sees this. And we dropped this stack like this thick in front of her. And we were telling her, you know, all of that stuff that you had to do, all you have to do is kind of review these. Um, all of the last week's um, data has already been scrubbed. You just need to review it. And, um, you know, you can still use the system if you find any errors, but, you know, our testing has shown that we really shouldn't, we should, really shouldn't have any. And we were thinking she was going to be so excited and her face fell. And she like looked at, I swear she looked like she was going to cry. And I was like, she's like, if you did all of this, then what are those people going to do? And I turned around behind me, there was a glass wall and there was a cubicle farm with 26 people that I never met before. And I didn't know anything about. And all of those people were who were the people who were going in and typing and recorrecting the names and addresses and everything. And they didn't have any work to do. Now. So that day, we were able to, the, the, the HR department was able to realign, like, I think, 10 of the people, but 16 people lost their jobs. I went home and I cried. And that was like, the day that I realized, it's like, you don't just put in systems, you, you are changing the lives of the people who use it, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and so that's why it's so important to, and, you know, to try and, and, and make sure that people are aware of what changes you're bringing about, because that's costly too, right? Even that, you know, on the one hand, yeah, you saved a bunch of money, but, you know, the cost of doing that, the perception of your project, all of that, it affects it. Um, I don't know whether any of you guys have any stories like that about, you know, um, systems affecting people or anything. Um, but uh... to tag on what you said, Bradford uh, said sometimes give people what they want and not what you think they need. I think that ties yeah. into to what you're saying. That, exactly. Um, which so moving on to like my point two is 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 about mapping the processes to your vision, right? And. I know for me, like I love going to conferences like Sync because I get to like see presentations on technology that I may not have heard of or seen before. I get to learn about things and I come back with all these fantastic ideas of what we can do with all this stuff. But at the end of the day, having that vision and knowing how things are actually happening in your organization, you got to kind of bring those together, right? Um, one is like share your vision, right? If if you think that there's a way that you're you can build that better better widget, um, you know, you want to talk to people about it, right? And get them excited about it. But at the same time, it's like listen and find out, like, okay, you know, if I want to, you know, improve my, you know, my my, you know, customer intake process or something like that. Talk to the folks who are doing it and find out what they, what, what it is that they do. Because um, one of the things, it, it, another great example, and again, I, I don't know why I'm digging so far back in my history to do this, but um, how many of you guys remember millennium compliance, right? I mean, that was, that was, that was huge. And I managed millennium compliance for, um, Dell corporate. And one of the things, yes, yes, exactly. It's like, we had to like, we had to do the whole thing. Thanks, Brad. Um, we had to do the, the whole um, upgrade 
to um, Office uh, 2000, what, what was it, Office 97, and we had to like upgrade hard drives because there wasn't enough. I mean, there were, there were so many pieces to it, right? But one of the pieces, um, the one of the pieces that um, we found in the process of testing these systems was that, you know, at the end of the day, when I say that people are the core of your business, it's like they know the pain points and whether you know it or not, they're doing stuff in the background to try and make things better, right? And you may not know about it. And we found when we were going through and we were testing like stock options programs and things like that, guess what? There were Lotus Notes databases sitting on people's desks that had like all of the transactions and, you know, dates and everything like that, that they built so that they could make sure that the data went to the vendor who was actually managing the program properly, right? Yes, <laughs> it was 22 floppy disks. Um, and and the, the thing was that we, in, in documenting this, we were able to uncover like the additional hidden processes that people were doing. Um, so that we could take away those pain points from them and while we were in the process of doing this improve it. Um, more recent examples that, that you know that you can think of uh, that I can think of for that was um, you know um, like at one time I worked at uh, Verizon I was in the support center and we were talking to um, we were talking about like the whole omni-channel thing right omni-channel is big we want to make sure that when whoever your customer is However, they touch you, whether it's through a support channel, through the phone, through billing, you know, whether they've sent you an email or something, whoever, the next person who touches them, they can see when the last touch was, what it was, all of that type of stuff. Doing that, um, you, you know, they, they like built all these different types of things. Like one, the particular process that I remember in, that I remember was, um, my first job when I was at Verizon, we had, um, I, I got assigned the, um, the, the, the past due billing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And this project had been going on for a year, right? And I walked in and I'm looking at like my piece, which was the, you know, the, the, the web portal stuff. And I'm looking at the web portal stuff and, and I'm seeing what they're asking us to do. We have to like, you know, check and see, is this past due? Then we're going to do. And then I got on the meeting with everybody else. And there was an IDR guy. And there was somebody who was, you know, doing the, um, the email. And there was somebody from the support case side and all of this. And, and I was like, instead of all of us doing this, the same logic, why can't we just ask the guys who own the, you know, the, the actual collection system they could like, we could send them our customer data and they could tell us what we need to tell them. Oh, we can't do that. That's like, I like picked up the phone and I was like, you know, I emailed him and I found out he was like two floors below me. And I was like, do you mind if I come down and talk to you? And I like pitched him the idea and he was like, oh yeah, we would totally be willing to do that. You know, completely streamline the, 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 the level of effort for all those other teams, because we just created one, you know, generic um, program that everybody, IVR, you know, chat, you know, the, the, all the different systems, the Omni and channel systems accessed to pass in the past due data and get a response for how they want to handle it. And that's all we needed to do. But you got to talk to people to be able to do that. Was bottom line, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's still sneaker net, but now it's called Teams and Slack and all of that. You can still do it, right? Doesn't matter if we're virtual. Um, but anyway, um, to that to that point, you know, again, it's about documenting your existing processes, identifying those pain points, and then you know, I don't need to tell you guys this. There's a whole like subdivision of business process modeling and DPMN and all of that type of stuff. But the outcome of that should be a wish list of what you want. Whether you're a big organization or you're a small organization, if you can write down a wish list of, I wish I didn't have to 
you know, you know, do this repeated, you know, answer every single question on this. Um, you can make that wish list, and that wish list is what you end up talking to the vendors about. Um, Sylvia just gave an, a, a, wrote a, a, a note here. A good example is Delta Airlines. They bought out through early retirement 200 pilots. The business picked up, and they're buying routes. routes. Now they don't have enough pilots. They're asking their pilots to fly more and just bear with them as they try to address their pilot shortage. However, they haven't renegotiated the pilot contracts with this new three years ago. Pilots are not happy and consumers are 2,000 pilots. Exactly. So it's not just about technology. Again, it's about, you know, the technology is supporting the people and how are you, how are you managing the people, right? Um, but uh, so, the, the point is, if you if you have a vision, that's great. Communicate it to you know, communicate your idea, and somebody is going to like tap you and say, "Hey, I like your idea. I've got I've got something that I can help you with that." Right? Um, it's all about the networking, and use that, leverage that when you're talking to your vendors to to make sure that you're successful. Right? Um, the third one. And it's, it's be agile for efficiency and success. And, you know, agile has been around for a lot longer than just agile. I mean, I remember way back in the day, they used to call it, you know, rapid application development and, you know, joint application. It's just a little bit more structured now, but it's the same kind of thing, right? You identify a core team that's going to be, you know, kind of your, your champions for the stuff that you're doing. You use, you know, the, the whole scrum, sprint, whatever, prioritize your deliverables, make sure that everybody's on the same page and that you're all like in agreement for what you want to, uh, you know, for what you're trying to do. And, and the other thing is, you know, I've seen so many pilots, so many, I've been involved in so many where they just think they're going to like buy something like Salesforce and they're going to roll it out to the whole world and it's going to just like magically work, right? We all know this is not how this actually works, right? You've got to you've got to find somebody who's going to like be able to like work out the kinks, find a group where you can like test it out and make sure that you know like what are, what are the things you're going to deal with and then roll it out. Not even just that, but you know, breaking out like the the um, the functional pieces and parts, right? It's like where is going to be your earliest win, you know, if you could put this in um, and, and, and break it up into manageable pieces that you can do. Um, you know, my recommendation is always like, you know, four to six weeks, you know, type of, of, of groupings because you can get enough in that you can incorporate training, you can incorporate, you know, a significant amount of functionality but you can also, you know, um, you can, you've got enough, there, there's enough time to actually get something significant done, right? Um, Tim, I'm starting, I'm at the starting point with my new organization. This is a struggle, but I work on bringing everyone on for the ride. Their feedback is invaluable to the future success. That's exactly it. Um, one and a half years, to roll out Windows 2000 and Office 2000 with pilot groups and ventures, exactly, right? I mean, this is this is new technology, same old stuff, right? It's the it's it's the you know the lather, rinse, repeat methodology. So we release, we re review, we repeat, right? And that retrospective is so important. Make sure you take time when you've rolled something out, and you say, okay what did we not like about how this part of the rollout went and what can we do better? Because, you know, that's the only way that we continue to improve, right? Um, <laughs> yes, users are resistant to change. Um, and IT is like, yes, it's always, it's like just as soon as we get something like it's done, here comes the latest release. It's just, if you don't like change, IT is not the field for you, right? Um, but uh, um, speaking of that, that, that comes to my next point as a perfect lead in, Danny, is 
own your transformation story, okay? This is one of the things that, you know, especially in IT, you know, we're, we're not always the best about communicating. One, because we've just got so much shit to do, right? I mean, we're just so busy, right? Let's be honest, you know, who's got time for this, right? But at the other point, on the other hand, it's like, if they don't know what you're doing, they're going to guess, they're going to create their own story, right? Um, so you want to, you want to um, tell them who, what, why, when, where. Let me give you an example, right? When I walked into Project Time and Cost, it was the first time I'd worked in construction. And I knew nothing about construction. And I did not know that there was a such thing as um, construction engineering. I didn't know that was a thing. Apparently, there are people who are civil engineers, mechanical engineers, who just from looking at a drawing can pretty much tell you, depending on the level of the drawing, um, they can tell you to within 5% how much it's going to cost you and what you need to do to build that building without ever putting a shovel in the dirt. I did not know this is a thing. This is actually like required by federal law for any kind of federal construction contract, right? Well, I walked in there because they, they were trying to um, take some software that they'd used for 20 years called M2 and move it to the web, right? And they had a small team of 10, 12 developers sitting in a dark corner because that's where developers work best. Don't give them light, give them darkness and they'll be happy. Um, and there was 300, you know, white, black tie, you know, the tie and, you know, button down shirt cost engineers, you know, around the corner from them who had no idea who these kids were with their long hair and their, you know, their, their, you know, their, you know, computers and multiple screens and everything. They did not know what these people did. And guess what? Those developers didn't know what those guys did either, but we were building cost engineering software. I was like, so have you tried this out on any cost engineers, you know, to see whether we're like on the right track? No, nobody had ever tried it out. It's like, so they had come up with their own stories of what was going on. So we started, you know, doing q and I was like, we did a lunch and learn. Let's show them what we're building. Let's get their feedback on it, you know? And they were starting, you know, as soon as we showed them what we were had built and how it worked and what some of the other pipeline products that they were, you know, that were under the covers, they were excited. That was all the buzz at the coffee table, at, at the, you know, in the break room, right? People would come by who had never interacted with us and say, hey, I had an idea for the product, right? So the who, the what, the why, the when, where, we need to be responsible for making sure that we own that story and tell them what's going on and get them engaged. Um, you can do, you know, once a week, whatever you do, do it and, you know, make it routine, whether it's, you know, uh, email, if you have a Slack channel, like here's your latest updates, you know, um, if you've got somebody who's creative and you can do like a flyer once, once a month or something like that, do that. But also, like I said, create opportunities for questions and feedback. Lunch and learns are a great way to do that, right? If you give free cookies at two o'clock in the afternoon, guaranteed, I don't care how crotchety and grumpy they are, they will show up for the cookie, right? So let them come in and kind of see. Um, I see a lot, have a lot of uh, comments here. Um, Tim said, I found by uh, sitting down with my users and just watching them do their job role function, this always lets me uh, see what they are doing, their work standards, and have a candid conversation on their pain points. Um, that's exactly. Um, and, and on that story, Tim, I'll tell you, okay, I got another story. I was working at Dell. This was um, I was at, uh, it, was, it was my first job at Dow, and I got called in as a Lotus Notes developer, and they were using Lotus Notes for their um, call center. And um, one of the pain points that they had was it was taking almost 10 to 15 minutes to close out a call. And so the first thing I asked them before they like, you know, they showed me the system and everything, I spent a day 
just sitting behind some of the call center reps to see what they were, you know, kind of what their process was, what they were doing. And the first thing I found out after like a day of watching them was that it took almost 10 minutes just to find them in the call center system, right? To just create a ticket to put down their call. Not to mention they had no idea why they were calling until, you know, uh, until they started talking to them. They spent 10 minutes just talking. We made a simple change that we just, the first thing we did was we asked, give me your employee ID or your social security number. And with that, we were able to pull up the customer a profile and their last ticket, right? So just with that, we reduced the call time by 15 minutes because that was what they were spending so much time on. And now the, the, the folks who are sitting there and answering the call could say, I see I, you called about, you know, your benefits card um, that you hadn't received. Um, is that what your, you know, is that what your, regard, your call is regarding? Or I see you had a, a case that you wanted escalated. Um, and here's the update on it because the update was in the case. It was just amazing the number, the, the, the stats that went through the roof. Um, but uh, um, anyway, yes, doing process reviews to get a feel for how departments operate, especially at the level that we're at, we're not always in the day-to-day -day grind of what they have to go through. And that really needs to inform us on how we can improve the overall quality of the business. They're the ones who can tell us. We don't, we don't know what we don't know, right? Um, so anyway, thank you guys for all the feedback. Um, and then the fifth point and the last point is measuring your success. You know, like I said, I mean, there's KPIs and metrics, like I told you with the, with the Dell Call Center, you know, when we were talking about, you know, the, um, with, with, Millennium compliance. When you're talking about omni-channel, when you're talking about there, there's always those those KPIs, but there's also you know it's it's how do you how do you celebrate that with everybody else so that it's not just you know yay we did this. It's like look at what you guys helped us to do, right? Because the more the more ownership that you can give people for the success of your implementation the more they're going to own that implementation and make sure that it gets pushed through, right? Doesn't mean that it's always going to win. Sometimes you're going to lose. Sometimes you've got to make some hard decisions. Um, we, we did a global SAP implementation and all the rest of the world at Dell at the time was on SAP. Guess what? Corporate never went over because there was just too, it, it was, it was too many issues from a process perspective to get core functions for the business done, and, and we had to pull the plug. It was heartbreaking. But from that, we learned, and we were able to push forward and be able to implement something that integrated with all of the rest that worked for corporate, right? Because corporate is different, you know, corporate is different. Um, and then again, you always want to create opportunities for, um, for, you know, questions and feedback, you know? Um, so let me see. Um, IT and technical people need to take some psychology classes to understand how people who don't follow the ones and zeros of how technology works. That is absolutely, I mean, all of this that I'm talking about, this is really, it's, it's, it's emotional intelligence, it's, it's group psychology. It's it, that that's exactly what this is, right? Um, the uh, um, and yeah, uh, Charles said we actually try to invite the director, one to two supervisors, and departmental training coordinator, to then just have them show us their job and their pain. The intent is to minimize prep for either side. Um, and and these things are great. The more if you rotate and you can try and incorporate as many you know, make sure that everybody feels like they're going to get a chance to like, you know, have their input on it. Because even the quietest, sometimes it's actually the quietest people that you want to try and figure out how can you get them to, to engage. And, you know, at the end of the day, this really does help 
not just with the success of your implementation, but the success of your organization as a whole, because people, you know, they, when, when they pull through something difficult like this together, you get connections that will, will, will drive your organization. It, it brings everybody closer together, you know? Um, I remember with, the, with like the, the um, with the uh, Millennium Compliance Project, we were the last ones, Del Corvo was the last to get started because nobody knew. It was like, they sent somebody to go to the meeting every month, you know, and it's like, this has nothing to do with me. I'm like, oh my God, do you understand how many systems we have to like go through and test? Um, and, and one of the things we did to get everybody on board, um, it was kind of fun. We like, one, we made it a big deal. Like we had logos designed, we got like, polo shirts with the, the logo people every Friday they were wearing them we set up we, we converted a closet into a test lab and have like you know 286 386 you know the old way of old max and stuff so that everybody we had a place that they could all like you know run their tests bring them in you know groups in to like test their systems um we we had luncheons and because this was HR corporate and HR IT, which were two completely different organizations, we tried to get them to, to bridge that gap, that uh, divide between the, the two organizations by doing these things. And I remember the most telling was when we brought everybody together for a you know celebration when we were done, because we were, we were the last ones to start, we were the first ones done, and we gave people like recognition certificates for their systems that they could like put, you know, that they were responsible for it. And, you know, had the, the VP of HR and the VP of IT come and, um, you know, present the awards to everybody. And listening to the two of them talk, it was like the VP of IT was, this is such an important, you know, uh, milestone that we've accomplished. And, you know, you don't know how much we appreciate it. And the VP of HR was like, you know, I just don't really, still don't really understand why, but I'm really glad you guys did it and good job, <laughs> you know? So it's, 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 it's communication, not just down, but sometimes we also have to communicate up is what I guess I'm trying to say. Um, but uh, um, let's see. Um, yes. Exactly. The, the, you know, it pays big dividends to win over the most reluctant users. Absolutely. Um, like I said, you know, sometimes those quiet folks are the ones who they, they have the most institutional knowledge, but they don't necessarily, you know, they'll, they'll sit back and they'll be like, you're, you're the biggest, like, why, why are you even, do, why are you doing this? What, what is the point? And if you can win them over and show them that there's a benefit to it, they can help drive your success, right? Um, so uh, time for questions, which is, like I said, this is, this is uh, my, my point in bringing all of this up is not that this is, you know, something revelatory or anything like that, but it tends to get pushed to the background. And I think that in a lot of projects, we need to bring it to the foreground. Mm -hmm.